May the Spirit of God give you power to do exactly what He wants you to do so that you end up exactly where He wants you to be with Him. It is the desire of God that we be His people and that He would be our God. Jesus makes a statement um, as the women of the areas bring their children to him so the women of the areas they bring their kids to Jesus and Jesus close disciples can't really appreciate the attention he is paying to these women and the children they don't really understand the value of children's ministry as we refer to it as children's ministry so the disciples of Jesus they're the ones they're adults they are grown men they're adult males even though he's got some adult females in this congregation of people so Jesus has adult men that follow him committedly Jesus has adult women that follow him with great dedication some of them are married but they're not with their husbands, they're following Jesus. This is recorded in Luke chapter 8. And so Jesus is being pursued by adults primarily. But in certain atmospheres described in Matthew 14 and Matthew 15, there are women with children. The word of God says that Jesus it prophesies that he would carefully lead those with young or lead those with children and so when Jesus and I think this is recorded in Matthew 18 these women so Jesus is in a place he's ministering these women they want grace on their children they want the power of the spirit to be on their children uh, they understand that Jesus has access to Father God they understand that Jesus can heal the sick. They understand that bringing their children to Jesus gives their children a greater measure of physical protection and spiritual protection. Physical protection in that if Jesus blesses this child, that means that sicknesses will be prevented. That means that poverty would be lifted that means that dangers that are directed at the child from the generation prior would be uh, prevented so the blessing the word of God and I, and I believe that this is written again I believe that this is written specifically in Matthew 18 it says that as these women brought their children to Jesus they brought them to him so that he could put his hands on them and bless them. I think that's what, maybe that's not in Matthew 18. I know it's somewhere. But but he, he put his, yeah, okay, so it's Matthew 19, verse 13 through 15. It says, then where they're brought to him little children. Now these little children, they can't do anything for Jesus as it relates to, in reference to making him feel good about their attention. Generally, ministries in, in our generation, and at least in America, gener generally women, uh, ministries rather, in our churches and ministries in our generation, they, they might want to minister to the kids uh, simply because they know that ministering to the kids will, will attract adults. So if the kids want to attend church and enjoy their time while they're at church, then the adults with money will be there. The adults will come and support this effort. So if a church is established by people who are simply seeking to fulfill personal success goals 
then the church will structure their children's ministry to attract the children's parents uh, and in hopes that these adults will support this endeavor, this church, this endeavor. Um, so many times the churches are designed to stimulate some sense of pride or lust within the leaders. So that's the structures of the bad churches. No matter how it is, no matter what it looks like, uh, many of the churches that are out of fellowship with Jesus, that's the purpose. The purpose is simply to satisfy some ambition, some moral ambition, some emotional ambition, some psychological goal. The Holy Spirit, though, wants to visit the children. He wants to minister to these children. Jesus says in verse 14, as the disciples are telling the women to leave, the, the, the women are trying to get Jesus to lay his hands on their, their kids. Jesus, please lay your hands, transfer blessing onto our children. Please uh, release the mercies of God onto them. We know that if you lay your hands on our children, they'll be safer, they'll, be, they'll, they'll, they'll have more access to God, they'll have more access to the blessings and prosperity of God in this life and in the life to come. They know that Jesus is a source of God's power. They know that Jesus is a source of God's knowledge. So whether it, it's for the purpose of strengthening the child naturally or spiritually, they know that Jesus is the source. And so they bring their kids to Jesus. These women, they want their children to be successful spiritually and naturally. So they understand that success is based on their access to Jesus. They know that. They know that in order for their kids to be successful, they've got to bring their kids to Jesus. And so that's what they're doing. They bring their kids to Jesus, and they want Jesus to touch their kids. They want Jesus to lay his hands on their heads, on their stomachs, on their chests, on their backs. Listen. Please, Jesus, release the power, release the blessings, release the defense, release the mercies, transfer that onto our children. The disciples, the adult males, the adult males that followed Jesus very closely did not see the value of these children or of the next generation of people. So that's who these children were. These children were eventually by the mercies of God, going to become adults. They were eventually going to be the people who spoke for the society. This is the next generation and, and the following generations. That's who these represent. That's who these are. The word of God in Psalm 127 describes children as arrows in the hand of a hunter. So the man can send them forth to get things done so the hunter he's trying to catch that over there because he needs to eat it so he's going to send forth these arrows he's going to draw these arrows back to himself and let them go and that's descriptive of how we spend time with our children so that they are strong enough to prosper when they go from us and whatever they do when they leave our presence is supposed to benefit us. Whatever our children do, when we send them out, that's supposed to benefit us. So we pull the, so we have the structure, we have the bow, we take the bow, we extend it, and we pull the arrow back toward us, and we let it go, and it's going to go out, and it's going to hit something, it's going to impact something that eventually we can go and benefit from. So it says the children are as arrows in the hand of a hunter and it says that the children 
confront the enemy. They, it says that at the end of Psalm 127, blesses the man that has his pouch, his quiver, or his family full of these children. They, the children, will speak with the enemy in the gate, meaning the children will be a line of defense for the city, for the nation. The children will help defend the nation. The children will help defend the family. So the Lord says that these children are special to God, that God loves them in a, in a, in a very affectionate, tender way. He wants to make sure that they're safe. He wants to make sure that they know who he is. The Lord wants the children to be taught by their parents to know him. And he wants the parents to exhibit a lifestyle that is exemplary or that's representative or expressive of the love, knowledge, and power of Almighty Father God. Yes, the Lord wants the parents to live in a way that impresses the children to follow God, to know who God is. So the parents' job is to reveal Jesus to their children. That's the parent's job, whether they have physical access to their child, whether they uh, consistently, whether they have limited access. It is the parent's job to demonstrate Jesus to the children. And so the word, of, the word of God says to train up a child in the way that the child will go. And when he's old, he won't depart from that way. And that's a promise that God does give that we need to enter into. You say, David, but well, what about when it doesn't happen? Listen. You do your job and let God decide who's who. But ultimately, it is your responsibility to teach your children to position them to have access to the knowledge and power and love of Father God through Jesus Christ the Lord. So he says, I want you to. Uh, so Jesus in verse 14, he rebukes, he, he, he corrects his disciples he 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 corrects his disciples because his disciples did not see the value in these women bringing their children to Jesus the disciples were under the impression that the children don't don't affect society right now these kids don't have a major impact on society Jesus is here to change the world. These children aren't world changers. These children aren't in control of society. They're not as valuable as the adults. If the adults want access to Jesus, then let the adults have access to Jesus. If the children want access to Jesus, that's not something that they need. They don't need access to Jesus. The, 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 Jesus doesn't have time for the children. Jesus doesn't need to minister to these children. These children are, 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 they're not going to appreciate what they get from Jesus. That's what the disciples were feeling. That's what they were sensing. That, that was, that was their belief at this time. No, they're not important. Uh, they should be seen and not heard type of thinking. And so, and Jesus says to his disciples in verse 14 of Matthew 19, suffer or allow little children and don't forbid them. Don't prohibit them. Don't be a barrier to them. They need to come to me. Jesus is saying, make sure the children have access to him. That's what he's saying in this passage. That's what he's saying almost 2,000 years after this is written. Bring the children close to Jesus. Why? Because the Lord gives children a personality that expresses the heart of heaven. He is saying the children have a thinking pattern. They have a nature that exhibits the kingdom of heaven. And we consider how generally forgiving children are, how adventurous they are, how, how creative, 
how I mean in inventive the children are special my goodness they you don't generally know what they're going to do depending on how old they are and so you get you can look at the child and see their growth you can see the beauty in the children you can see the innocence you can see the purity and so the lord says these children their traits are like that of god's heaven he's saying that god's way god's meekness god's gentleness God's joy, he's saying that these kids are an exhibition of the joy of the creative nature of God, the joy of the Lord, the creative nature of God, the, the, the purity of God, the innocence of God, the beauty of God, the loveliness of God, the tenderness, the delicateness. Yes, Jesus is saying, yeah, God loves these little children and he designed them to exhibit purity, to exhibit love, to, to exhibit affection, to exhibit directness and truth. Yeah, that's what the children exemplify. And so Jesus said, do not keep the children away from me. The kingdom of heaven is like these children. He's saying, when you look at these kids, you are seeing heaven. When you see these kids and their joy and their energy, you are seeing heaven acted out in a little minute form. And verse 15 says, and he laid his hands on them. And we know that the laying on of hands is a transference of the power of God. He is conferring onto them. He's releasing onto them. He's em the, the power of God, the knowledge of God, the protection of God. If there are curses on these children, they can be broken through the laying on of hands. If they are in a, in a position to be like a, an ungodly parent, the, the Lord can, through the laying on of hands, shift their personalities, enabling them to be free from a personality dominated by fear, dominated by lust, dominated by perversion, dominated by unbelief, dominated by anger and aggression and, and any evil curse passing down through the family line can be confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ through the laying on of hands. And so Jesus says, bring them to me. Don't reject them. Don't forbid them. Don't undermine their specialness, their special nature. In Matthew chapter 18, it, it talks about this in verse... One, at the same time came the disciples to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, verily, I say to you, except you be converted and become as little children. What's he saying? Except you be more likely to forgive, except you be more responsive to instruction unless you are more humble unless you are willing to let go of anger and animosity and bad situations unless you become more trusting unless you become more open more submissive to the truth to information given unless you are more easily manageable Unless you are manageable, unless you are 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 are, are trusting and and yielding and 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 full of cheer, unless that's what happens as a result of your conversion, you're not getting a position of authority in the kingdom of heaven, not in this life nor in the eternal state state of the kingdom of heaven. So he says to them, except you be transformed, because right now you think you should have access to eternal life. You think you should have access to eternal power. You think you should have access to eternal knowledge. But he is telling them that their nature needs to change and that they need to become like little children. They need to become like little children. They need to be more submissive. They need to be more innocent. They need to be more forgiving. They need to be more joyful. They need to be, be more faithful, more believing of what they hear from God, obviously. So he's saying, except you be converted, unless there's a transformation in your life that makes you more childlike in your thinking and in your 
desires, you're not getting a position of authority in the kingdom of heaven. You may not even enter into eternal life at all. In verse 4, whosoever therefore will humble himself. And so he's talking about the responsive nature of children. He's saying unless, the ch unless you become more responsive to the Father, unless you become more agreeable, unless you become more willing to do what what you're supposed to do then you're not going to have access whosoever therefore will humble himself as this little child the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven one of the things we discover about the miracles the power of god the knowledge of god is that it requires a submissiveness it requires a malleable nature it requires a willingness to to do what the Holy Ghost wants you to do, even if that means dipping in the Jordan, the dirty Jordan River seven times, even if that means walking around Jericho a total of 13 times, even if that means, you know, uh, throwing a branch in the, in the water in order to get a lost axe head to come up and float. Well, metal doesn't float. Well, if you obey the Spirit of God and do what he says, then anything is possible to those that believe. Jesus says you can tell that mountain to get up and move over there. If I tell a 29-year-old, hey, you know you can make that mountain get up and go and pour and go into the sea, he's not going to believe that. If you tell a baby that, or if you tell, by baby, I mean a, a child that's old enough to understand your words. If you tell your 2-year-old you can make that mountain move and go and take a swim that two-year-old is going to believe it whether it happens or not that two-year-old will believe that that's going to happen i remember tormenting my brother you know who was uh, four years younger than i was with you know things i would you know try to get to scare him and tell him that certain superhero characters were going to come and get him if he didn't do what he was supposed to do so maybe we had some chores and i would say hey you better do this or i'm going to call this particular character to come and get you no 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 and he would go and do the chores until he got old enough and realized hey that's not you call him he's not going to come you're not good this guy's not going to come but he was young enough to believe what i was saying because i was older than him and until his he began to re realize that that's not possible. So there are things that the Spirit of God has for us to enter into. There are l mercies. There are kindnesses. There are acts of God's kindness. There are things that God wants us to have access to that we might not gain access to because we don't really believe that the Spirit of God can or will do what he is describing that he does do. We were reading the book of Joshua today, and Joshua commanded the sun not to move and the moon not to move until he had fulfilled the will of God. Well, how likely are you as a 29-year-old, 34-year-old, 43-year-old, 22-year-old, uh, how likely are you to believe that a human controlled the sun by the power of God. You're not likely to believe that. Why aren't you? Because it's not what you've seen. And you, and, and you, we believe that things are going to operate a certain way because of the frequency with which we've seen the cycle. No, that's not how things work. That's not how laws, that's not how natural law operates. A man can't control the son. Well, a child will believe that. Jesus said we've got to be converted and become as children in order to have authority in the kingdom of heaven. They wanted to know who has the greatest authority in the kingdom of heaven. A, they're talking about the operational, the operative power of God on earth in this time now and b they're talking about which may have been a they're talking about eternal life okay because they didn't really understand what they were referring to when they were referring to the kingdom of heaven jesus was referring to the oper operative power of god that he was demonstrating through the healing of the sick the, res the restoration of sight to the blind the the, the 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 healing of the maimed people who had lost limbs and 
and and and Jesus is multiplying food. He's causing matter to expand. He's cursing trees, telling his followers that they can control nature. They can. Con- Jesus is exhibiting that man can control nature by the power of the Father in Jesus' name. Jesus is doing these things that the dead can be raised again. Demons that generally control people's lives can be evicted and driven from people's bodies, from their souls, from areas. Jesus is saying and exhibiting that all of that can occur. Well, if that's not what we've seen, we're not likely to believe that those things can happen. And so we in that unbelief, in that state of unbelief, as we see at the end of Matthew chapter... 12 and as we see in Luke 4 we we can uh, people can be so hardened that they f- miss out they lose out they 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 forfeit the available kingdom of heaven that Jesus brings. Jesus says you need to repent. Your mind needs to change. You need to become like a little child. You need to become more faithful. You need to become more responsive to what God promises. If God says he can do this, you have to have a heart that agrees that he can do what he's saying. A 16-month-old will believe things like that. I remember one of the young men his mother, her back was hurting her. Her back was hurting her. And her back may have been hurting her because she was pregnant at the time. I think she was pregnant. And her lower back was giving her problems. I think that's what was going on with her. Her lower back was giving her problems. And I told her. And so she asked me if I could pray for her. And so I called her son to, uh, to me. Uh, so I was standing in my kitchen and I laid hands on the woman's back for healing. But as I was laying hands, I did, uh, the, the thought came that I should not do this, that I should let her son, who was probably about maybe eight years old at the time, I should have him do it. I forget how old he was, maybe nine. I should have him do it. Like, David, you don't do it. Let this kid do it because he needs to learn that the Spirit of God is available to him. That's one of the things Jesus is referring to when he says, allow the little children to come to me. In one sense, he's saying, position them for me to bless them. In another sense, he's saying, teach them my way. Teach these kids early how to operate in the power of my Spirit, in my name, in Jesus' name. So I was laying hands on his mother healing and I stood there for about two to three seconds the thought comes you should let her son do it because he needs to understand that this promise is to the adults and to the children and to as many as are far to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God will call so I told him he was standing there and I said come pray for your mother so that her back is healed and so she was in pain. He walks up. He says, Lord Jesus, please heal my mother. I said, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to command. I think that's probably what I said initially, because whatever I said, secondly, whatever, whatever I said afterwards, I told it was a reaction to him not doing specifically what it is that I told him to do. So I said, come command your mother's back to be healed in Jesus name so I uh, so the young man is watching me pray for I said wait come here I said pray for your mother's back or something like that or command your mother's back to be healed he begins to ask the Lord Jesus I said no you command in Jesus name for her back to be healed and I want you to do that until she tells you it feels better and it took about maybe four to nine seconds and she said oh the pain is gone the pain is gone yes so it was my job as their pastor to make sure that he understands at this tender innocent pure age you need to know that the spirit of god can heal through you because he looks at you as a line of defense he looks at this child as a line of defense. He looks at this child because the devil looks at our child, at our children, as an open door to destruction. Jesus looks at these children as...
as representatives of the kingdom of heaven as they embrace the gospel. I told you a testimony about my daughter last week when I was making some musical sounds with my mouth and my daughter was under a year, under two years old and she looked at me and she first was trying to duplicate or replicate what I was doing. She was trying to do what I was doing. I was making some musical sounds with my mouth that you know some hip-hop music sounds with my mouth and this was in 2007 or 8 I suppose not 2007 late 2007 probably early 8, 2008 making some musical sounds with my mouth my daughter first she tried to replicate what I was doing and then she looked at me in a very stern way and she said where'd you get that from she said where did you get that from I felt convicted I said I don't know she said, you got that from TV. The Holy Spirit was using her to confront an act of worldliness. He was using her to confront an act of worldliness. Uh, so the Spirit of God used her to correct me. I remember another time we were having some, uh, we were doing evangelism, evangelism in, our, in this community where the church was set. And I had this dream that I didn't understand, but it made me afraid to do outdoor evangelism. And so when I, I, I had the dream and it scared me, I told the church, I said, we're not doing outdoor evangelism until um, further notice. And so this little boy came to me weeks later and he told me, he said, Brother David, I had a dream about you. I said, oh, yeah, what was the dream? Because as a man of God, I don't know if the Spirit of God wants to talk through this child right now. So I need to be open to what the Holy Ghost wants to say, whether he says it through an adult, whether he says it through a child. The sheep of the Lord hear the voice of the Lord. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Feed the children. Make sure the children know the doctrine are full of the knowledge and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the young man came to me and he, he was younger than 10 years old, uh, probably seven. And so he says to me, says to me, Brother David, I had a dream about you. I said, okay, tell me the dream. He said, I had a dream that you were a magician or a wizard. That you were a wizard and you were turning the people into turtles. And that sounds like a kid dream, doesn't it? Oh, I'm a wizard. I said, oh, yeah. I said, yes, I had a dream. You were using magic and you were turning the people into turtles. I said, okay. And I stopped for a few moments and I said, this is the Lord. The Holy Ghost is talking to me. So if in this young child's dream i was a wizard and i'm turning okay so the holy ghost is telling me that i am using my god ordained authority and influence i'm using the power to manipulate people and to make them afraid what are these turtles these turtles are animals that can hide their head hide their arms hide their legs in these shells i'm telling the people at that time it's not time to do evangelism because god it's not going to protect us if we're out there. Danger will happen. Demons will get us. Bad people will get us. Let's not go out there and do evangelism. So that that was, at that time, our responsibility. That was our mandate to be out there preaching the word of God in these settings. But when I had a dream that made me afraid, I told them, no, it's not the will of God that we're out there doing that at that time. And at that time, that was wrong. It was the will of God for us to be out there doing that. But I had caused them to be afraid and so the Lord spoke to this child in a manner that he didn't understand but that I would understand once he would relay that message and I said that's the Lord and so I told the congregation I said listen this is the will of God it doesn't matter what's going to happen this is what we must do but we must make sure that we are seeking the Lord in prayer and in his word as we're out here preaching this gospel and the Lord enabled us to do that successfully for years and so he spoke to this child he spoke to Samuel so Samuel could talk to Eli he spoke to this child and 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 made sure that this child would speak to me in a manner that I would hear because Jesus said my sheep hear my voice and if he wants to speak through a child then the people of God need to learn how to hear that uh, how to hear that 
there's a prophecy that says a little a little child will lead them. It's talking about in this next phase of the kingdom of of God, and so the kingdom of God is descriptive of the available authority and power of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, as explained in John fourteen twelve through fourteen as it relates to the miraculous and answered prayer and the miraculous is important not to excite carnal desires for the spectacular for the amazing for the fantastic no it's designed to confront satan's efforts against our lives it's designed to the miraculous is designed to quickly do what the Holy Ghost wants done without needing external factors. No, you don't need that to get that done. No, you won't need that time to get that done. No, you don't need more human cells to cause that to work this way. Just say it and I, the Lord, will do it according to my will. And so the Holy Spirit has to convince us that this is the way and so sowing into or ministering to the children ensuring that they are equipped to hear God and to operate for God with readiness if the readiness is critical so that's why the word of God says that we should train up our children and we should raise our children in the nurture we should bring our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Their atmosphere should be conducive to the power and knowledge of Almighty God. They should know who Jesus is. They should love Jesus. They should desire Jesus. When I was very, very young and I was having evil dreams, my father taught me at age four years old how to overcome evil spirits in my dreams. And he simply taught me that I should pray when I'm being attacked in my sleep by evil dreams. He taught me that at age four years old. And the method he taught me, the method of prayer he taught me from Matthew 6, praying the Our Father, as we call it. He taught me that. And that worked for me for the next eight years. Every time I had a horrible dream, a, a nightmare, as we call them. I would utilize that method against the devil and it would work with 100% effectiveness. And, but once I was 12 years old and I, the Lord had taught me much more through church and, and other uh, interactions with men of God and my mother and women of God as well. As the Lord had taught me more, he was requiring me to utilize more strength and more of his knowledge in order to succeed as a 12-year-old, as a preteen, as we call it. And from that point on, I had to become more faithful. I had to learn about the Lord. So when the Lord says, allow the little children to come to me, he is saying, make sure that the children have access to God. He is saying make sure that the children have access to the power. They have access to the healing. They have access to the atmosphere of God's presence. They should know God. They should love God. Make sure that you teach them about Jesus, about the Father, about good and evil at fundamental stages when they're moldable, when they're malleable. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter maybe 11 or 12, probably 12. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come, meaning before you get older and and, and become convinced in hardness and unbelief that there are certain things that God won't do or can't do. So he's saying before death comes, he's saying before your mind gets hardened, through disappointment, through fear, through anger, through through hatred, through unforgiveness, through anger. He is saying that as we age, then we get worse in our thinking. We get worse in our emotions without the leadership of the Holy Ghost, without the washing of God's word, without the sanctification of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. And so he says, Make sure that you you sow the word of God into these children at fundamental stages because as they get older, 
they're going to learn or they're going to be in position to think that life is evil, that life is hard, that they have to lie, that they have to steal. They might think that they're, un that they're in danger. And if these children think that they're in danger, they might lie, they might steal, they might fornicate, they might perform witchcraft, they might do something that separates them and their children from God. They might take on beliefs that separate them from God. And so it is our job to make sure that our children have beliefs that connect them with the Lord, that, that strengthen their fellowship in God. In our church, we've at times gotten into trouble with certain groups of people, certain uh, family members of the church people, because we would baptize the children at certain young ages and we weren't baptized so the Roman Catholic Church and even the Lutheran Church they baptize infants uh, believing I don't know what the Lutheran belief on this is but the Roman Catholic belief and we know that Roman Catholicism is a false religion so it doesn't mean that everything that they teach is false but much of what they teach is so wrong that believing it would se separate a person from God. So the Roman Catholic doctrine teaches that Jesus Christ did come in human form and that he's God in human form. They do teach that, but they also teach that you should access him by praying to his biological, his earthly mother, Mary, and that you should bow to statues and things like that. So that's evil that that would damn you so the Roman Catholic doctrine all of it is damnable it's like having water and yet putting a certain amount of poisoning in it it's water but a percentage of it is poisonous and if you drink all of it you'll die that's what Roman Catholic doctrine essentially is so they baptize infants believing that the infants if they die then they're going to hell. They believe that the children, or purgatory, they're, this false belief that the Roman Catholics have about the afterlife, a place of purging. So they have bad beliefs. Um, so they baptize infants. And then the Lutheran Church, they also baptize infants. There's a bad belief that permits them to do that. I don't know what it is, but to baptize an infant for the purification of their spirits and souls the spiritual purification of their souls isn't what the word of God leads us to do or teaches that we ought to do because the person that's being baptized at that infant age is unable to understand the will of God through Christ Jesus uh, in, a, in an identifiable way. L little baby, do you know who Jesus is? No, you don't. And if you do, you can't tell me. You can't verbalize. You can't confess that, can you? No, you, you can't. So we're not going to baptize you. There's a grace that covers you. There's a mercy that covers you. The, the, you are, the child, the infants are not charged with Adam's sins. They're not, they're not sinners before the Lord. So they're not guilty of Adam's sins. They can't tell the difference between good and evil ultimately. So they are not guilty of Adam's sins. They are conditioned to eventually make conscious decisions to rebel against the Lord, but they're not charged as active sinners until they are old enough in the eyes of God, and there's no absolute age, 12 or 7. We don't know what the physical age is for that child as opposed to that child. So one child will differ from another child in spiritual knowledge and understanding, and God determines who's who. But once a child begins to exhibit that they can understand the truth. At that point, the Holy Ghost requires them to get baptized because at that point, they can lose their little souls if they are taught rebellion against the Lord. So, which is what the cultures and the traditional societies teach. So, I remember, so we've gotten into trouble with certain family members of our church members because they didn't think that the children 
were ready to be baptized. Certain ones, they didn't think the children were ready to be baptized because they didn't think that the children were, were uh, truly understanding the will of God for their lives. Um, first of all, it, it's quite common to baptize adults and for the adults to be in open rebellion, whether they're 20, whether they're 40, whether they're 50. You can baptize an adult who's 33 years old and after having taken him to 12 weeks of baptism class, if you apply that method, and yet he's still in rebellion. He still wants to do things he shouldn't do, watch things he shouldn't watch, say things he shouldn't say. And you say, was he ready? Why? Because he was, well, he was a, in a better position to rationalize his decision making. Uh, well, Jesus said, let the little children come to me. So with that as a command, we identify if a child says, I'm ready to be baptized. So we baptize children at early stages, five years old, because they were exhibiting an awareness, a spiritual awareness. They were exhibiting a spiritual awareness that communicated their sensitivity to the voice of God and their their awareness of good and evil. And once they were exhibiting that awareness and asking to be baptized, we baptized them. Other family members were saying, you're not supposed to do that. Why would you do that? You're not supposed to baptize these children. The disciples did not think it was appropriate to bring these children children to Jesus. Don't bring these children to Jesus. Jesus doesn't have time for them. Jesus said, bring these kids to me because the kingdom of heaven is, is a manifestation of the nature of God on these kids. So if these kids are exhibiting an awareness, Josiah, King Josiah became king at eight years old. Okay, and the Lord used him to reign. If these children can sense the voice of God with clarity, the Lord wants them dedicated to him as, as, de as faithful. So he baptized my, our oldest daughter when she was very young because she was exhibiting an awareness. God baptized her in the Holy Spirit when she was three years old with the evidence of speaking in tongues. When my son was seven years old, the day before, either the day before he turned seven or on his seventh birthday or around his seventh birthday. I knew he was, he was six years old at the time and he had just turned seven, I think. And then I thought to myself, he should, he's seven years old. This is about the age where he is to be held accountable by God for his decision making. I said to him, or I said within myself, he probably needs to be baptized. I said that a, a, on a particular day. Within 24 hours, so I said that maybe let, just throughout a day, I said that on a Monday. On the Tuesday, which aren't necessarily the act, actual days, the very next day, he's sitting and eating something at the counter. He's seven years old at this time. I'm sitting behind him on a, ch on a lounge chair. Without prompting, without warning, he turns to me and says, Daddy, when am I going to be baptized? I said, why do you ask? He said, I think it's time for me, for me to be baptized. I said, okay, we're going to baptize him. I wondered that a day prior, and here he is at seven years old saying that that's what he believes he ought to do. So that's what we did. We dedicated him to Jesus through water baptism for the purification of his body, soul, and spirit. We receive measures of purity. We receive measures of knowledge, measures of power through water baptism, through repentance and water baptism. And not including what we get when we are baptized in the Holy Ghost. So once a person gets the inclination that this should happen and there's an awareness of the righteousness of God versus the works of the devil when they can distinguish for themselves between the holiness of God and the works of the devil and they are asking to be baptized 
we we commit them to the Lord through baptism. If we just baptize them because they're young and we want them to be baptized or we want them to participate in church or we want them to participate in collect in the corporate communion, that's not a good enough reason to baptize a child. So if the child has no idea what's going on except for, you know, let's play with these dolls or these toy cars or something like that and you know, they're going to have some measure of the knowledge of God if you teach them, but that doesn't mean that they're ready to be baptized. There will come a time when they will let you know as you speak the word of God to them, hey, I, I want what you're saying. That's the reaction that they're supposed to have. When you when you sit with them and you teach them the word of God and they say, okay, so so I hear what you're saying. When am I going to, when's that going to happen to me? That's what they're supposed to essentially say. Yeah, so the Lord wants us to repent and to be baptized. And if we're not baptized, then God's going to judge us as rebel, rebellious criminals. And we need to commit to him and live for him and do his will. Well, I, I want to be baptized. Yeah, why do you want to be baptized? Because I want to go to heaven. I want to be with Jesus. I want to follow him. I don't want to go to hell. Oh, yeah, you sure you understand? Yeah, I, I accept that. We don't put him in a 12-week class if he's 7 years old. We don't put him in a 12-week class if he's 27 years old. We don't put him in a 12-week class if he's 87 years old. No, today is the day of salvation. Jesus, John the Baptist, or Jesus didn't baptize people himself, according to John 4. His disciples were baptizing people. The point is, oh, you want to be baptized. Well, we got, we've got to make that happen as, as soon as we can. So... See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, can we baptize a person? So the children should be taught about the Lord. They should be immersed in the knowledge, presence, and power of God. We should encourage them to read the Word of God, if they can read, or at least listen to the Word of God. And we should... And we should explain it to them we should impart power and lay hands on them jesus said in matthew chapter 18 that we ought not to abuse the children we ought not to ignore the children we ought not to make it seem as though the children don't have kingdom value now uh, when we have these worship settings the children should be free to expressively Praise God so that the glory of God can come down. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. That doesn't mean that you should let your kid get onto the platform or run and grab anybody's drumsticks. No. What that does mean is they should be in an atmosphere where they feel free to engage Almighty God. Because he will minister to them in a special way. John in 1 John chapter 2 says, I write unto you children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And he says that twice. And so the Holy Ghost wants to be poured out on sons and daughters. That's not just talking about males and females. It's talking about actual children. People who are of a young age. Little children he says unless you become like a little child you're not going to have access to the kingdom of god but then he also says be careful not to offend one not to hurt not to damage the mind of not to bruise not to curse not to dismiss the children he says don't so if a church says well we want to have the children play worldly video games or do worldly things just to attract them. That's not what the church is supposed to do. If the church says we want to isolate the children from worship because they're a distraction. Well, did Jesus do that? If Jesus didn't do that, the church has no spiritual authority to do that. I remember growing up in church. And not wanting to be in the adult services because I was put into the children's services. And once it was time, I was 11 years old or something like that, to transition from children's services to adult services. They were so different that I didn't want to go to the adult services. I enjoyed the apple juice and the Ritz crackers and the Keebler crackers and the playtime and the soft, colorful carpet and the toys and the 
the cartoons. I wanted that. You say, well, yeah, that's why you have young adult ministry. And did Jesus do young adult ministry? Did Jesus do children's ministry? I'm not saying that you don't have a time when you pull them aside for the young adults. I'm not saying you don't pull the children aside for their special learning time. But but when it comes to the corporate gathering, we need the young, we need the middle-aged, we need the old, we need everybody engaged in the worship so the glory of God can fall with the children on the young adults. The Holy Ghost will do special things through the young children, through the little children in the house of God. He'll pour out his spirit on these little children, which will set fire to the rest of the congregation. You have no idea what the little children might say. You don't know what the little children might do. One of the brothers who was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the first gift he received was the gift to interpret tongues, not to prophesy or to speak with new tongues. He could interpret tongues, and he described the power of God that was on him, and said the power of God was on him, and he said he said he could understand what the babies were saying. He said, I can understand what the babies are saying. I can hear that they're praising God. I can hear the babies I can I can understand by the Holy Ghost what they're saying. You might be watching this and you might and me stating that would probably have provoked or evoked a sense of unbelief. But that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, unless you become like a little child, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. You can't have access to the higher things of God. Because you are classified in that capacity as an unbeliever. Your hardness of heart, your inability to accept the fact that God can speak through babies to himself. is you, yeah, you don't believe it could happen. So the Holy Ghost leaves you on the outside. Okay, well, I'm not going to talk to you. Oh, you don't believe it? Well, I won't talk to you. You know, people think that their beliefs determine reality. Your beliefs don't determine reality. God's will determines reality. The word of God says, out of the mouth of babes and infants or children that still breastfeed, he perfects praise that he might still the enemy or stop the enemy and the avenger. So when we keep the children in church, you keep the babies in church during the worship, the babies might not be saying what you understand. That doesn't mean that they're saying what God doesn't understand. Said, no, the children better be in position to worship me right along with the adults. You don't take them. So if there's a time when you want to teach the children, go and teach the children. If there's a time when you want to work with the ch- babies and change them and feed them, do that. Bring them back into the house of God because they are ordained to interact with God in this corporate setting. No, from a young age, they need to know how to preach. Not That doesn't mean that they're going to get opportunities to preach in the public setting. From a young age, they need to be in, they need to watch preaching from a young age. They need to watch worship from a young age. They need to watch the driving out of demon spirits from a young age. When I was a little boy, two years old, and I was in the back of the church with my toy cars, playing with my toy cars, my father would bring me to these church gatherings where they were driving demons out of people according to what Jesus commanded people to do. And I'd be in the back playing with my toy cars and the adults would be in the front. Come out in the name of Jesus. They're casting devils out of people. You hear people cry crying out, acting crazy. The kids need to feel like, no, I have authority. Because guess what? The devil, what you abandon, the devil will come and occupy. So my children from very young ages have told me, Daddy, the devil was in my closet. Daddy, I saw a demon standing on my dresser. It's a little small demon. He looked like this. Daddy, I saw two little spirits over there talking, and they looked like mice. Daddy, in the church service, this is what I saw. They're four years old. They're three years old. They're seven years old. Yeah, Daddy, this is what I saw. Yeah, Daddy, I saw this angel standing over there. He had a very straight face. Daddy, when this happened, I saw the glory of, I saw the throne of God. He had a crown on his head. Daddy, yeah, absolutely. They need to be in an atmosphere where they are being saturated with the anointing, with the power, with the knowledge of God. 
If you're not releasing that, conveying that, transmitting that, positioning them to receive and to transfer that back unto God, yeah, then I guess the children could be an obstacle if the church service is not one that is engaging the Holy Ghost according to the word of God. Yeah, if you're not pursuing God, then I guess the children could be an obstacle. And you might want to put them in some colorful room with big bears painted on the wall. But if you want the work of the Holy Ghost to be fully active, according to Joel 2.28, then you want to put the kids, the, you want to put the old, the middle-aged, the youth, and the children, you want to put them in one room and let them worship God in spirit and in truth. Because the Father seeks such. I heard one person say this years ago. He said, God does not have grandchildren. He said, God doesn't have grandchildren. So your children are not your children. Your children are God's children, just like you are God's child if you're born again. So it is our job to lay hands, to impart grace, not to leave the kids over there to do that because the Holy Ghost wants to do some things in them at young ages so that when they are old they don't depart and so that they can stop the enemy and the avenger this is your brother david williams with jesus ministries jesus is coming let us make our hearts available to receive him amen